All right, welcome to our talk by Marianne Ibrahim on Chicago and Paris art scenes. I am Julie Moody Freeman, the director for the Center for Black Diaspora Studies. Thanks so much to Marianne Ibrahim for agreeing to be here with us this evening. And uh, thanks to all of you who are taking time out of your precious time to be here. I'd quickly like to acknowledge your co-sponsors and thank our staff. This event is co-organized by the Department of History of Art and Architecture and the Center for Black Diaspora. A big thanks to Dr. Mark Delancey for organizing and moderating this event. Without you, this could not have happened. So I'm really grateful. Thanks to the Center for Black Diaspora staff, Catherine Douglas, the administrative assistant at the center, and Jessica Williams and Jennifer Ogomiki, a wonderful student workers. Let's begin and I will hand you over to Dr. Mark Delancey, the chair of the History of Art and Architecture, who will introduce Mariam Ibrahim. All right, thank you, Julie. <clears throat> so um, our guest for the evening is Mariam Ibrahim, who owns a contemporary art gallery uh, here in Chicago. Um, a brief introduction or overview. In 2012, she established her first gallery in Seattle and quickly made a name for herself. In 2017, her gallery was awarded the first Presents Booth uh, Prize at, the New York, at New York's Armory Show. And in 2019, uh, she moved to Chicago and opened her current gallery here. Uh, in 2021, she opened a branch gallery in Paris. And in the same year was awarded the Ordre des Arts et des, des Lettres by the French Ministry of Culture. The gallery is regularly represented at international art fairs, and, and if you're like me, some of you may have caught their presentation at uh, Expo Chicago this past weekend. Uh, although the artists in the gallery that the gallery represents are uh, perhaps not exclusively African, we included in this series on ex exhibiting African art in Chicago, because our gallery does represent an impressive roster of contemporary artists from Chicago as well as the diaspora. Our interest in presenting the diversity of ways of thinking about art from Africa and its presentation to the public, uh, the Marianne Ibrahim Gallery uh, reflects a divergence from our past two lectures, both in thinking specifically about contemporary art by artists from Africa, as well as the commercial side of the art world as opposed to uh, museums. So uh, with that said, uh, I wanna thank uh, Marianne for being here. Uh, and uh, uh, participating in this lecture series. Uh, and I turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you so much for, for having me and the DuPont Museum. Um, I'm very much honored. Uh, and uh, I have been um, sort of a slowly recovering from the expo, but very happy to be here. Uh, and I have been, um, a fan of your lectures and really appreciate how much you connecting different individuals to not only your program, but it's general practice, this general um, sort of a um, program centered around uh, the African uh, art studies. Um, well, my name is Marianne Ibrahim and I thank you for this presentation. So um, I haven't been speaking for that long in terms of a lecture, I'm sort of used to be, you know, challenged and tackled and, and, and used to some interaction. So it seems very long, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's, it's very short to, to summarize in, in, in 45 minutes, you know, what we have done uh, in the past uh, 10 years, because this year, as you mentioned, is a very special year for, for me and for my team as we celebrate our 10th anniversary. Uh, 10 anniversary by sort of sticking to our core, core program and core interests, which was to always um, push uh, and push forward the artists of the African diaspora. So we have been doing this for, for a long time. I felt that it was, it was a really necessary uh, um, you know, um, um, a necessary act to sort of uh, 
uh, create the 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 conversations of the artists of the African diaspora with the rest of the world. Uh, so I have sort of a center this presentation around three artists and as I will go along with the three artists you will sort of understand what our program is about. So at the very, first, at the very beginning we've sort of a focus to um, photography um, from the African continent and the reason why it was there was a, a sort of a rush and a, and a strong uh, um, presence of photography at the time and I will explain to you why it was very simple because they were sort of the medium that often was accessible and presented and, and easily exported from the African continent to sort of send a file uh, in terms of the photography. And then at the time when I started, there were very little, uh, um, there were very little, I'm not saying that there were, there were not any production, but there were very little uh, artists, very small group of artists that were working with that were working with other mediums and photography at the time. And then slowly it started to be a little more democratic where not only the institution, but the private collectors were also eager to understand uh, all of the artistic expressions from you know, the continent. So as those interests sort of started to emerge, we also adapted to those changes. We also adapted to the, the, the you know, the sort of a, easy reach that it was becoming to have access to artists that were working with other and different mediums. So uh, as, as Dr. Mark uh, Delancey has um, shared, we started the gallery in Seattle in 2012 for personal reasons, simply because my husband and I have decided to move, uh, uh, have decided to move to, to the US because we were so much intrigued with the new politics and, and also with the new, you know, um, their first, the first uh, uh, black president, which was Barack Obama. So we were very much um, enthusiastic about all of this shift and social shift. So that's also something that, you know, you, you kind of look at the United States as, you know, the, the, the country of all possibilities. So for me personally, it was like, this is where I want to live. So that's how it sort of started the project of, of, of opening, running a gallery was always there, but I felt like I needed to experience all of these social and political transformations. So Seattle was really a first step. Um, and that sort of a journey lasted seven long years. And, and Seattle was not really very, was not so much respond, responding to the, the, the program and the art that we were presenting simply because Seattle doesn't have much of, of it doesn't have a strong uh, African American or African descent community, so they would not easily, you know, connect with the work, and and so that sort of a pushed me at the very beginning to sort of reach out and had to to do the, the the fairs. And at the time when I was doing the fairs, not only I was the only black person, you know, showing art, but most of the art that we were presenting of African descent, they were the, probably the only, you know, that the, the was a concentration was one of the few booths that presented African, uh, African diaspora artists. And now it's all over the place, which I'm super happy and proud. Um, but at the time we were like kind of a, 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 a rare, a situation. Sometimes I, I would call it an accident. Uh, so when we, uh, when I started to sort of move around the, it's being those global art scene. It's when I encountered like-minded people and I got to see more, you know, um, African intellectuals and African American curators and so on and sort of a, started to create a global village for my own and 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 that was something that I was able to see out there in the world that was not present in Seattle. So so there was a necessity for 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 me and for our artists to move closer to a center a place where I felt uh, they will connect and they will critique and work with the artists and and, and that was Chicago of all places because Chicago represented um, as, as even though, you know, it's in the shadow of New York, but Chicago has a place of, you know, um, a very important place in terms of institutions, but also uh, has important schools and has important 
um, artists, uh, when you think about it, the most expensive artist, you know, is from Chicago and that's Kerry James Marshall. So all of these sort of uh, um, elements help me, you know, sort of decide uh, and, 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 and de decide on moving the gallery to Chicago. So here we are, uh, uh, two years and then with, with, with the COVID as well, but we just opened the gallery in September, 2019. And then six months later, we had to shut down and like everybody else, but we never stopped uh, pushing and working with our, with our artists. Uh, and and we, that is, I mean, at that time we decided to develop the, our publications and decided to do other projects such as editions, but Chicago has been, you know, very welcoming and, and sort of a reassured me in the choice that I have made. So through this presentation of these three artists, I would like to give you a little bit of the history of the gallery. So um, the first artist that I wanted to highlight, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, is Amwako Boafo. And Amwako Boafo is uh, an artist based in Ghana. I don't know if you can show the next uh, this is Paris. This is a gallery. We'll get back to Paris. But Amwako Boafo is one um, is, is is one of our artists who's a painter, a figurative painter, uh, a, a figurative expressionist, you know, artist. And his story is is one that few people would qual few people would qualify as a fairy tale. So he uh, was born in Accra and sort of uh, decided to study in um, Vienna of all places. Uh, and when he went to go through the, all of the, you know, the academic, you know, um, training, he was often told that, you know, that his figuration wouldn't be, you know, some sort of appealing and that he's, Black figures would not be very much understood, and sort of a trying to direct him in a in a in a place that he was not necessarily comfortable. But what he extracted from you know his um, time in Vienna, the fine art school, was that he was able to combine different period and artistic movement into his practice. And by saying that, is often we think that you know. A, a lot of artists have been taking a lot of, have been, you know, um, have had inspiration in Africa, but here's an artist who's coming from the continent and then using and all of that knowledge and also getting very much inspired by what has been done before. And so two of the artists that he was very much moved by was um, uh, were Egon Schiller and Gustav Klimt. So as we go through, you will understand the works that an artist who's coming from Ghana, studied in Vienna, has sort of created his own style that has been, that is now, has now inspired over a hundred of artists. He was able to revolutionize the, 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 the way African or black portraiture has been, has been made um, through the past decades. On the next, you will see, a, a, this is him standing here in front of one of his painting. But this is an, our upcoming show where you can see the, the, the figure here. His technique is uh, very recognizable. Uh, he has created from himself a strong signature working with his hands. So, and mostly his fingers. So all of the figures that you see on the body and all of the skin, all of you know, the black figure, figuration, uh, been executed with his hands. Uh, in this, work uh, that he, the new work that he will be creating and you probably are the first people to see. Uh, they are, he incorporated scenes and um, sort of a landscape where often he's um, associated with very traditional portraiture where you see a single figure and a whole, you know, monochromatic uh, background often very abstract that you don't, you have to feel it in, in your, in your painting, in your, um, you have to feel the, the, you have to experience that. So, uh, as I mentioned, Amwako Boafo has, uh, been an artist who's extremely demanded, um, very much appraised because of the uniqueness of his work and very much recognizable. So the art world 
immediately connected and responded to his work to a point that uh, it sort of a uh, it sort of a created a really rapid growth for the artist, both from the private collection and institutional collection, uh, which can be overwhelming for such a young artist. And, and through that, uh, he was able to open the gates for the artists of his generation, his friends, and the people and the, and, and the artists that went through the same uh, academy and the same schools. So beyond that, he's also an artist who's extremely generous with his uh, contemporaries and he's creating right now one of the most beautiful artist residents in Accra, one of the first kind where he will be able to host artists who don't have spaces uh, to, to work, artists that need to have, you know, um, that needs research, uh, that needs um, critique, uh, because the, the thing that we don't realize, mostly in Africa, there is a lack of infrastructure, there is a lack of, you know, museums, there's a lack of spaces where artists uh, can, can produce. So we have been very much, you know, um, in, in sort of in a challenge to be able to bring these artists yet out of the continent, but also give them the opportunity to, um, you know, um, accompany them in, certain, in those kind of a projects of residence and also you know, creating more bridges between um, the, the African continent and the rest of uh, the world, because today he's collecting uh, um, sort of a, he's collecting audience and community are all over the world, from South Africa to Asia to, to the Middle East. And so, so he's, he's, uh, he's, um, uh, he's, he's sort of a, uh, popularity uh, is not singular to him. There are more artists also very much in that sort of a situation. Um, and because they are, they are the forefront of a new generation of artists. If you go, if you keep going, you would see more of the, of, of the artworks. And one, uh, in this work, for instance, uh, Lemon Bat, yeah, Lemon Sundress uh, here also, I'm really sorry about the quality of the image, but you can see the grass in the, in the, in the back and you can see all of this laborious, you know, sort of a paintbrush in the back and also this character sort of a standing, looking at you, staring at you uh, in, a, in a very pride, in a very reg regal, you know, way. And, uh, and most of his characters are inspired by real people, uh, by people that he, very much an admirer. And there's always an element of Prince in his work. And that's where he combined the two artists, uh, Gustav Klimt uh, for this maximalist sort of a backdrop and, and, and sort of a um, photo transfer and also the way he's expressing the figures uh, with, by altering the, the, the skin and the smoothness of the skin. The next work is also uh, another work where you can see how he's able to, he's a, he's a very strong colorist and you can see how he's able to create different, you know, um, um, backdrops and same, this poster looking at you uh, is also reflective of how the youth and the African youth are looking at the rest of the world. And there's not a, a sentiment of, you know, sort of a, we here, we need to be assisted, we need to, they are absolutely in control of their identity and they're in control of their faith. Uh, and on the socks, on the, on the socks, you, there's uh, a photo transfer, which he has applied over and over. So there's much more than just, you know, a work and a, and a figure, there's, you know, different techniques that he has applied in this work. Uh, and you can see on the scale, they're pretty, you know, important. So. Amwako Boafo is going to be subject to, he has already an exhibit, he had an exhibition at uh, the Museum of African Diaspora in San Francisco, and the exhibition will be touring to the, um, uh, the contemporary art 
uh, of Houston uh, that will start end of May. So he will have a, a sort of a large, uh, um, we, sh we shouldn't call it retrospective, but it's a really good, uh, really uh, an important um, solo presentation of works from 2018 up to now. This work is particularly interesting because uh, this work sort of uh, engage a collaboration that I don't know if you're familiar with, with uh, the, the Dior brand, uh, where he was the first African artist to collaborate uh, with such a really elitist, elitist um, uh, couture house, uh, and that was in 2020. They were fascinated by the way he's using the colors uh, and all of the fashion elements in his work. So that was also subject to a beautiful collaboration. And for an artist who works so closely with figurative, they, what the collaboration extracted was non-figurative elements, the shirts, the patterns, um, the backdrop, the abstraction in the backdrop, and, and basically recreating this character uh, like a tableau vivant. And that was one of the nicest projects that we, uh, we were able to do. And, and also showing again, this advancement and the possibility that, you know, artists uh, of the continent and the African continent are not excluded for, with, you know, such type of collaboration. Uh, later on, we were able to create another collaboration, which also is a little bit, um, could be a little bit overwhelming for, for certain people with the with blue origin where one of his work were actually on the top of the rocket and basically uh, that sort of a rocket went orbit up to the space and there was the figures that you know anyone out there in the galaxy were able to see and I found it so uh, so ironic because the first man coming from the African continent and the first faces that the universe would see would be African. So there was a kind of a return on, you know, how the history and how the uh, place of origin and provenance is, uh, it's, is still in the conversation and, and still present for, uh, for the artists. Uh, so Green Beret has been a, a, an image that has been a very strong image uh, and uh, a very popular one. Um, so if we can go on the next, so yes. This work was presented in Miami. Uh, it was uh, a work that went through a sort of a competition uh, for which we won uh, with uh, another artist from, another artist based in Chicago, Ebony Patterson. So it was wonderful to have two galleries, Monique Meloche and I sort of sharing the first prize uh, that, was, um, uh, that was launched at the Miami Art Basel in 2019 before everything shut down. So this work is now in the permanent collection of the city of um, uh, Miami, South Beach. And you can see clearly all of the colors and the vibrancy, and he is not shy about using these very, uh, um, you know, sort of a block colors, and yellow is one of his favorite color. If we can go to the, yes. Having talked about Amoako and his figuration and painting, I wanted to also stress another artist, also from Ghana, but who is also working with a different medium, and, uh, and she's currently at our exhibition. I really invite you to come and see the show because uh, the PDF or anything that you will see online will not translate or give justice to the complexity of her work. So Zora Poku is an artist born in uh, Germany of a German mother and a, and a Ghanaian father and uh, has, ha, has a background on, in fashion. Um, and fashion in the sense of craft making. So uh, she then moved to um, Ghana to be closer to her father's family and reconnected uh, with her a family that she hasn't been in, in contact with and sort of exploring that other part of her identity. So as you would see, the work behind her is a work that is currently uh, in show at the gallery. 
and it's uh, it's a work that is called I Have Horizon. Horizon. So her work has really sort of a shifted, even though we have stayed in the textile. But when we look at the art um, that are you know, sort of uh, in general, if we're looking at all of the different genres, textile has never, has, hasn't has really been part of a very strong um, sort of a medium. It's been a medium that has been associated with women and craft and by, by textile, I mean, you know, all of the broderie, I mean, you know, all of the, the quilts and so on. So that is a medium that has been very feminized and also put in the category of decorative art. So it hasn't received much of novelty, but the way she sort of transformed the, the, the work on textile is, is as close as a complex work that you will find, you know, uh, in, a, in, as in a painting uh, in, or, you know, a sculpture. So if we go on the next work, this is an, a, a view of the presentation that you will you know, uh, you will be able to see at the, at the gallery. But um, the next image, there will be some, you know, some sort of a close up. So the work that you have has screen prints in there, uh, has um, um, uh, fashion, I mean, uh, textile collage, has sewing, has woven. I mean, it, it's such a very uh, complex work um, that has been also entirely executed uh, in, uh, in, in her studio in Accra. So both artists exclusively work in the African continent, exclusively work in Ghana, and yet has a very strong international presence. Zora is in many museums, uh, like Amuako, is also under, you know, strong studies. And one of the major work that was collected by museum was the Tate, and it's a really long mural uh, textile where she depicts her family, her brothers, sort of a sitting in thrones, and it's a, it's such a complex work. But on this work, uh, which has been a labor of two years, uh, Zora has been diagnosed with breast cancer uh, in in late um, 2019, and her work went completely upside down, and that's where she sort of a, thought about what is left, you know, what, what happens to the artist after the artist is, you know, is gone. And there was also conversation around, um, you know, legacy, there was conversation around, you know, longevity. And so for, for her, the, the part of researching has been an important aspect uh, in, in her practice, because she, basically lay out all of the ideas that she wanted to um, that she wanted to create and sort of a, make them into you know works and one source of uh, one of the source of inspiration was you know um, uh, the concept the Egyptian the ancient Egyptian concept of life and death and not and, and creating that sort of a eternal, life and so she went to you know and source all of and in her entire uh, um, uh, her entire practice completely shift but she went into those um, transcripts and books and art uh, that we found uh, you know in encyclopedic museums but also researching what it means to 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 continue you know to continue life and what it means to be, what are the means of the concept of afterlife. So you can see the body parts and all of the hands and the offerings and the mask are all something where she sort of cut it her bodies in pieces and sort of a stitching everything back. And so there's a surgical aspect in her work, but there's also an aspect of symbolism and surrealism where she's basically deconstructing and reconstructing uh, her new self. So that also that goes from different chapters that, sh that are still ongoing uh, and that goes from the healing to death and then coming back to life again. So a work in, in, in the making that I mean, sort of it took two years for her to, to do, you, you will be able to see 
the outstanding results uh, of uh, in the exhibition. And I am so in favor of, you know, leaving the artists the time to research and to work and to 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 sort of a you know um, plan those kind of an exhibition. And in our gallery, we have uh, artists that we've been working with and. You know, after three years, we were able to host their first uh, exhibition, and and I think when you're, especially when you're a young artist, it, it's so important to to take the time because in three years, there's so much that that can change in terms of you know the work. When I look at the work of Amwako Boafo three years before I met him, I don't think I would have been ready to work with him. But there was a constant evolution, which sort of, a, you know, made me think about, you know, the longer we wait, the better the exhibition would be. So Zora is an artist that over the two years has strongly matured and has sort of a delivered, you know, institutional quality uh, uh, work. And uh, without any, you know, sort of a surprise, uh, we were happy that her work also continued in this exhibition to enter uh, and acquire it by institutions. So on the next work, um, sorry, next artist, um, sort of a closing, but again, this is a perfect, you know, since we are all in Chicago, but this is the, perf the, 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 the perfect situation uh, for us to be here to continue to deliver our you know, program and, and, and exhibition to, you know, Chicagoans initially, that's the first target, but please uh, we'll encourage you to come and see the, the show of Zora Goku. And the last artist that I wanted to highlight is Peter Uka, who had his first uh, exhibition last November. Peter Uka is a painter, realistic painter, but there is a lot of a nostalgia around his work. And uh, Peter Uka is Nigerian, born in Nigeria and currently living in Cologne. He has done his uh, MFA in Dusseldorf and he is an extremely um, sort of a rigorous uh, painter in the sense where he's not into the form of expressionism as Amwako, but he is, you know, an artist who clearly um, demonstrates, on, on, you know, um, demonstrates his skills and the craftsmanship as a painter. So as we will go along the work, uh, this work was presented in Paris for our opening show, but you can see here the scenes that he creates. Um, this is a work that is currently being shown at the Flag Art Foundation in New York, but you can see here the, uh, the, the, the whole layout and the richness of his, uh, of his paintings with always a very, you know, rich background. There's almost three layers of the man who's, you know, uh, tidying up his shoes to the lovers and, you know, the back. And it's like a box in a box. It keeps going further and further. And that is this exercise that, you know, uh, Peter Muka uh, enjoys the most. It's not simply creating, you know, sort of a figures, but scenes. And Peter Uka uh, work really, question about the idea of nostalgia or black nostalgia because when we look at the you know at the at the time and and especially recording artistic recordings of the African diaspora and that also include the African American and Afro Caribbean it somehow starts at the moment of liberation you know and starts from the decolonization start from all of this time so anything before is a little bit blurred because certain artists could not have the liberty to work. They didn't have the means to work. And so when, how far does your memory go back? How far do you, do you construct um, uh, sort of a memory? And so he uses those images of his childhood uh, from his parents as well of characters uh, that may have existed in the time, but sort of a characters that he borrows a lot from 
uh, in his imagination, but a lot from the photography and especially the studio photog photography from Malik Sidibe and all of the, you know, artists, photographer at the time. Malik Sidibe is one famous um, photographer among others, but in every city in, uh, of the Sub-Saharan, in every city, there was a photographer and a studio that were sort of a, you know, crystallizing that moment of freedom, the moment of, you know, emancipation where, you know, Africans and the rest of the world were taking over their countries and pushing, the, you know, the, the, the colonialists out of the country. So, uh, so Peter Uka is very strong in those kind of memories, as you can see these this scenes that seems a little surreal where you have, you know, the naked body in the back and then these two guys well dressed as almost, you know, sort of a, extracted from a, a, a photo studio. Uh, and, and that's what Peter Uka likes to uh, uh, create, the background, but also the expression of the, the, these two characters and the way they so fly and so well dressed and the details of the shirt the sort of a, the inscribed you at a certain time uh, uh, where certain time in the history where you would say like these are, these guys are coming from the 70s are coming out of a movie so so Peter is uh, generally a nostalgic uh, painter that uh, has created an entire uh, environment but based on his imagination he's an artist that uses very very little photographic elements in support of his work a lot of his work a lot of his paintings comes out of his own imagination uh, on the next one this is yeah this is called beach life and the next work can you go on um, yes Blue Jacket, also same um, work, very rich, uh, where he's also an extremely detail oriented when it comes to textile and all of, you know, the different uh, position and all of the, uh, um, you know, sort of a wrinkles sort of like that he's able to recreate uh, and always this kind of a background and this green and rich, you know, um, um, elements that he uses on the plants. And this image is very dear to me because I have seen so many old images of the African studio where they kind of are staging with this plant where they're kind of are holding a flower or they're holding. And I will, you know, if, if you have seen the work of, of Say Duqueta, you will see a lot of elements uh, that has been inspired, but Say Duqueta has an, a beautiful photograph of a man sort of holding a flower with huge sunglasses. I mean, they don't, I don't think they're sunglasses, but just glasses um, and sort of a, that has, you know, uh, a very regalian moment of, again, where you have seen in the work of Amwako, that sort of a position where you say, look at me, you know, I'm, you, gotta, you gotta stare at me, you gotta, you gotta contemplate me. Uh, so, so these are really works of, um, I mean, the, those paintings of um, Peter Uka really resonate in those 60s, 70s, style uh, of uh, photography and in the fashion as well. But yet there's something a little blurry in terms of time. It could be anyone, you know, that you will see um, in, you know, this, the street of Lagos or Accra. Um, so uh, yeah, so that is really a beautiful work. Um, I don't know if there's another one where I will be able to share uh, if there is another, photograph or painting. Yes. Tan Long John is my very, very favorite painting. Um, I have to have, I have to confess I have huge heartbreak on this image because it was, it was mine for a couple of seconds uh, before we released the work uh, to our collectors. There's so many works that I want to keep it for myself. Um, but uh, this is a very strong image also showing you in terms of the aspect of figuration, as you can see, 
as you probably have seen many, but in comparison with Amwako, it's a completely different genre. But there's something in the expression that, you know, Amwako could have painted that and vice versa. But there's something in the expression that has been, that is sort of a similar. And uh, this painting, in terms of, you know, the face and, you know, the luminosity of the face, only on the eyes, a little bit of us, it's really also something and a technique that Peter Uka, um, sort of a master, the subtlety of, of the figure and sort of the man sort of standing there with that much of his, you know, um, plants and, and, you know, sort of a lushy uh, background. So um, again, they, this is a work, um, this is a, painting that has you know a little bit of a nostalgia in his in his work someone that existed um, but not a clear image just a souvenir that he's that he's painting as you know and he struggles a lot from that so this work you know uh, could be anywhere and could be at any time so um, yeah. It's, it's a really beautiful, uh, well-executed, very, I mean, just perfect, I will say. <laughs> Even though there's not much of a perfection, there's a pursuit of perfection, but this is to me one of the best work that he has uh, uh, executed so far. Um, and this is uh, the presentation of his, and they're pretty large scale, uh, but this is a presentation in our gallery of his work. And, and there's always a different energy when it comes like you know, for Peter, for Amwako, and this work of Zora Opoku is a very thoughtful, a very intellectual kind of a work. I'm not depriving any intellectuality from the, the, but the other work, but they're just much more emotional and, and sort of engage with you in a way where you look at those characters and instantly there is a, an, an, a recognition where you like, yeah, I know this, you know, this is my uncle, I know this one. And the poster is, um, is, is really um, what sort of uh, engages with, with his work. Uh, there's a very strong familiarity with his, uh, with his paintings. So these are the three artists that I wanted to highlight. Three artists that are uh, from uh, the uh, African continent. And this is also another work where you can see always this this, this interact, interaction with these characters, but this some sort of a stillness in the time and, uh, and always this rich background. Um, so he's a very generous painter, basically not sticking to one or two, but he's kind of a pushing. And sometimes I say like, it's enough, just, you know, it's like, no, I need to paint that other figure and behind the window and, and, and I need to push constantly and create, a, a, you know, a, a situation where your eyes can go as far as they can. And, um, and what I was saying about this, those three artists, I mean, one, two working in Accra and then one working um, in Cologne, uh, there's always a connection to their place of origin. There's a connection with, you know, um, their pursuit of, you know, uh, trying to sort of have these memories coming back, but also thinking about the future in, an, in, an, in a non-conventional way as well. And so um, these, these three artists uh, for us have the same sort of a motivation when it comes to presenting their work, but there is so much, you know, sort of a distinction. And today when we all put everything under the same, um, box of what is today the contemporary African art, it's impossible for me to summarize. Because, I mean, we picked those three artists, but I could have added an artist who's, who's absolutely into the abstraction. I could have highlighted an artist who's a drawer and everything that she does is so conceptual. So there's not, a, you know, um, there's not so much about what is the genre, what is the type of, you know, um, the contemporary African artist. It's, it's a necessary pain to call it what it is right now. But I think at some point we will be able to drop that. I don't, I've never heard anyone saying, oh, this is a contemporary European artist, or this is a contemporary American artist, you know? So it's often, you know, 
always sort of a creating a differentiation uh, between these artists and the rest, even though they absolutely respond to, they, they, they respond to a certain culture, they respond to the, you know, the globalization of, 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 of culture. So there is not such a, you know, um, uh, um, a sort of an identity of what the African or the African American or the Afro Caribbean or the Afro Afro Afropean Afropean looks like, and our job is really to you know our mission. We say it's more than a job. Our mission is really to 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 break any perception that you have of what you would think um, that is you know the contemporary African art, and if we you know, add contemporary, because often it's just, you know, African art. Uh, so my, being myself and, and uh, an African person, an African <laughs> global, even global citizen, but being myself African, I cannot let anyone put me in a sort of a box and say, this is, you know, as an African, you should look like that. I don't look, you know, uh, African. I'm just me. I have my own personality and I have my own, but that is often what, is slowly, this is the prejudice that a lot of the African contemporary artists have, but this is slowly changing. And the institution are understanding those, you know, differentiation and they're changing the narrative, they, they're understanding the narratives. So, um, so any preconception or anything that you had of the African, um, you know, um, African artists that you had, I would you know, welcome you to come to the gallery and I will break all of your pre, you know, conception, pre prejudice or any of that, you know, in a minute. So we, we, we want to show various expressions uh, um, and all that exists, you know, um, of, of the artists, whether they are based in uh, uh, the African continent and there are also African artists based in the United States. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a big term, I would say. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's where my presentation. And, and I quickly, in 2021, we uh, have decided to, this is a, the Chicago chapters and all of the works that we have shared were works that mostly were shown in Chicago, but we opened in, uh, September 21, um, our first um, gallery in Europe and in Paris, because that's where I, I am from. Um, and this is where I sort of uh, been living uh, before moving to the United States. And, um, and our, our space is, it's, it's a really an interesting space because instead of having things really flat, it's got, you know, um, sort of a floors and uh, it's kind of a bit this way. Uh, but um, why Paris? Um, I think um, there was an urge, sort of a, somehow when there was some, you kind of want to go back to where you left things at. So I left Paris to come to the US because of this transformation. And now I felt to go back because I also feel there are some changes and transformation. Uh, France, is, uh, France has uh, been part of the colonization of Africa, I mean, maybe probably half of Africa. And so yet I felt um, that going back to, to Paris, um, not even mentioning the rest of, of France, but there was a lack of visibility for artists of color, period. And, and, and to me with the population, it, it, was, it, it, it wasn't really, something that um, it didn't sit right with me. And the institutions as well uh, were also in that kind of a space. And in the back of my mind, I've always wanted to sort of go back to Paris and create uh, a space. It was supposed to be the first place before uh, I moved to the United States, but it, it was necessary to create a space so that, you know, just to be closer to the, you know, African community or from the African diaspora to show that, you know what, you know, the, the, the way the African 
artists, the African art is not only objects or traditional art or art that they call primitive art. It's also artists of your age and artists that are responding to the world in the in you know in in a in a way that will inspire all the people of their generation. So um, going to Paris was a, there was a sense of duty, but there was also a sense of solidarity uh, of all of the African descent people that I left behind, which was like okay, we are going to we coming here to just you know um, share various stories and various narrative. So yeah, it was, uh, it was something where we really wanted to do. Uh, and also if you come to Paris, we would be, we'll, we'll be you know, we'll be happy to, to host you. And then, uh, so you can see all of our uh, exhibitions and some that you haven't seen in our space in Chicago. Thank you so much for that, that presentation and uh, insight into some of the, the history of your gallery, but also the, 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 the artists, that, some of the, the key artists that you uh, represent. And uh, for, the, for the audience, uh, if, you, if you'd like to ask questions, um, you can put your questions in the, the chat box and I will uh, um, uh, ask those of, of Marianne. But uh, perhaps I can have a go with a couple of my own questions to get started, uh, which is, uh, you know, one question I have is, is uh, you know, when you present, you know, when, with your gallery in Chicago, your gallery in Paris, uh, do you need to engage with the public in different ways? Do you are there differences in the way you present shows or? Uh, connect with the uh, Parisian public versus a Chicago public that, that, that's necessary or, um, or, 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 or not? Yeah, absolutely different. Um, the, the, you know, these, uh, these are, these are a universe, universalism, I would say, among the French and, and the way they look at you know other people and other cultures, uh, they're very much you know the curious and they want to learn and and there's 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 a part of surprise often that comes to them when you talk about aspects you know of when you talk about race and gender and all of that they're very they, they're still a little bit conservative and this is something that they're not very much you know um, want to discuss because you know it's the the country of, you know, the 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 what do you say the uh, the fraternité, liberté, égalité. We're all the same. We all, uh, but there's a lot of there, there is a lot of um, when, when we look at the the U.S. in their program, like in their studies, there is the studies of race. You know, it's 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 actually something that you learn in the university that people are. PhD around that. In France, it doesn't really exist, that aspect of talking about it. In terms of the demographics, you see that here we have like groups, like people can have their groups like, you know, this is a white person, a black person, this is that, you know, but in France, it's totally forbidden. So we all are, you know, one group of people. There's no distinctions in terms of, so, so when it comes to the art, they don't want to be questioned, especially what we're bringing, they don't want to be questioned around you know, race or gender or sexuality, they just want to look at the art for the art. And I think this is an amazing, you know, luxury that, you know, certain people may or may not afford. But when it comes to um, the, the, the artists that we have presented, there is um, a uh, sort of a, um, they are connected, they want to learn more about it, but there is a, it's not a natural immediate connection that Chicago will have. And the, 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 the US went through so much transformation just in the past five years. You know, when we look at all of the different movements, the social movements that there have been, the, you know, the Me Too, Black Lives Matter and so on, all, none of that has have been happening, you know, in, in Europe. So, so you know, um, the US have championed all of these, you know, um, aspect, the, the, the integration of, you know, different people, 
um, that are, you know, in, in, in the country and they, they have been able to absorb, you know, um, the works of artists of, you know, the African-American artists. So they championed that. They have, they, for France is like probably 10 years behind. Uh, and, and because we have here talked so much about those, you know, um, the, the lack of, uh, of representation of a certain population in the US in museums, you know, in schools, in the politics and all of that. So the day there's gonna be a Supreme Court judge, you know, a Supreme Court judge that will join France, you know, very proud, of, you know, but I'm not saying that the US is like all perfect, perfect, but I'm saying that there is on that aspect, there is a lot of, a, uh, uh, there, there is a lot of inequalities. Friends really respond to beauty and contemplation. The US respond, of course, to beauty, but they respond to the social politics of the work. You know, what does that mean? What is the engagement? And, and is this work really connected to my also political engagement? And so we have that sort of uh, uh, going on, but we're learning and we we seeing, you know, what works, what worked better in, in Paris and what worked better in, in Chicago. But overall, uh, I would say the US is a trendsetter for all of the, you know, um, the, the, it's a model that the European wants to be able to, yeah, to, to, be, to be close to. There's, there's a question from uh, Janet Purdy. Um, she, she says, wonderful presentation, thank you. What has the trajectory been like as you represent and present these artists and their work um, and others you work with to audiences, collectors, museums, and expos in the Middle East? Uh, yeah, I've done something in Dubai. <laughs> we have art in the, in the Emirates. We have one of our artists who will join the Sharjah Biennale in 23. So we try, we, I mean, we're here in Chicago, but we're trying to be all over um, uh, the, the place. Um, so uh, we, we would like to be a little more into that area. I was just there in um, January uh, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And they, what they are doing is pr it's pretty you know, amazing and revolutionary and how much space they're giving to art and culture. Uh, so yes, we would love to have more opportunities and be in that, uh, in that region because uh, they're doing so much for the artists and, and the infrastructure that they're putting in place. I was blown away by the Museum of the Louvre of Abu Dhabi, which is a museum that I highly recommend to check either in person or virtually but they have completely changed and revolutionized the way we present past uh, history and in conjunction with art and culture and people. And instead of us, you know, sort of a segregating, you know, groups like, oh, here are the African and here are the Asian, they sort of mix them through the same timeline, what was happening in Mexico this, and what was happening in China, what was happening in Congo at that same, you know, sort of a century or period. So I was, it sort of made me think about how we're presenting the artists. We have an artist in Japan, we have artists in Italy, and I'm like thinking, how do we put those timelines? What makes an artist connected to another artist? And, and I don't want to put the race or the gender or anything. I want to put into, you know, the time and what, what is happening in 22 in different parts of the world. So, uh, so yeah, the Middle East is one of our, you know, uh, place to, to, to be and very inspiring as well with the multiculturalism and all of the different, you know, uh, groups um, that, are, that, live, that live there. That, that brings to mind a, an, another question I had that, um, you know, you, you founded the gallery to represent uh, um, uh, artists from Africa, African diaspora and so on. But I, I saw on your website that I think is in the last year or something that um, you, you're representing a Japanese artist now. And so I'm wondering if you could talk about, you know, 
is is the mission of the gallery changing, expanding? What's to, how do you think about or how does that artist fit in with the gallery? We, we, we're not changing, but we just hate that people put us in a box. I always hated the fact that, you know, yet this is where it started because it's something that I was also very proud of and I was very much connected and I was, you know, if I wasn't going to do it, who was going to do it? Because clearly there was no much, you know, um, presentation of the artists and I would, I, I would I would present them not because they are black or African descent because I felt that they were good in their field they were absolutely excellent and today you can clearly see that the most sought after artists and all of that are artists are, are black artists and because uh, there's been a narrative that has been you know that has been going on for millenniums <laughs> and so it is it's been it's it's sort of the word is you know the word is interesting to hear other narratives and the public and when you look at exhibitions whether you know it's Kerry James Marshall or Kusama you get you just have to look at the queue in front of the of, of any museums people are interested in non-white narratives because they know that and we've been hearing that and especially from you know the western world and there is a, a, a very strong curiosity of something that doesn't look like you there's an attraction to what is different and so the artist uh, who's a japanese artist he he clearly fits in a gallery and i love what he's doing and and also he's an artist i'm not comparing his this artist or black artist, but there's also preconceived ideas of what a Japanese artist should look like. You know, it's always very manga, it's always very playful. And he's not like that. He's like, no, I'm looking up to Pollock. I'm looking up to, you know, um, this very strong abstract uh, expressionist artist. And he's also wants to get himself out of whatever, the way, however we caricature a, a Japanese artist. So. So we are all on the same, you know, sort of in the same boat in terms of creating uh, uh, um, a sort of a differentiation when it comes to, you know, um, uh, when it comes to perception that people have of artists. And he's profoundly a young contemporary artist. And we have artists that are the same age for which the word is interesting to hear from. So, um, I'm, I'm all over the place. I would not discriminate any artists. Uh, and I think it's pretty cool that we have a Japanese artist joining a, you know, a, 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 um, a sort of a focus and a predominantly black, you know, artist. I think he's, he's very happy and he's very proud of it. He's just, you know, sharing the news with uh, his Japanese collectors. He's very proud to join us. And, and that's how I would say uh, the, the, this generation of artists look at is to be in the global, you know, in a global international gallery that has, you know, artists from Sao Paulo, from Paris, from Baltimore, from now Chicago, we have our first local artists. And um, and I think it's it's a very rich um, sort of a you know we have a very you know expanded you know in terms of geography program so yeah. yeah picking up on, on Janet's question about expos in the Middle East so I, you know when you were talking about the expanding interest in, in um, African artists and, and so on. And, and I was thinking about the role of the various biennials and so on in Africa now. Um, are, do you present at any of those biennials? Do you visit them to find new new artists? What's, what's I guess my question is, so uh, what's the importance of those biennials on the African continent? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, biennial, biennials are very important for artists. I mean, they're biennials, they happen every two years. So it's not something that just is constructed, you know, in, in, in a few days. Um, yes, um, for, we, 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 we do our best. We work really hard to get, you know, this, it, it's, it's, there's so, there's so limited seats 
available for an artist to you know be at the, at the biennial so it's uh, it's it's really the you know top recognition that an artist can have among his not only his peers but curators uh, and and it's uh, it's it's a place where you know your work is going to be critiqued and reviewed and documented and so every artist that I know um, his dream or her dream so their dreams is really to get into those biannuals and so we we do our best uh, to for them to be seen uh, it's a, it's a very competitive uh, um, endeavor uh, so you know we always are happy for all the artists to be present I'm always uh, happy that the biannual also offer you know a range of artists that are representative of different uh, genre and geography and gender so you know, uh, biannuals are the ultimate achievement to me of an artist and has nothing to do with his market, has nothing to do. And that's why everyone's sort of equal, but it's like um, you could be not commercially successful at all and then have a massive installation at the biannual. And that is the most preserved, um, untouched, non-commercial, uh, where uh, they can they can be, you know, it's um, it's like the mecca of of all. So we always work and make sure that they get that sort of a visibility. But institutions are also, you know, the the custodian of of their work, and uh, they are also the, cust the the custodian of their narratives. So both are, you know, important. But on the other hand, I do privileged collectors that wants to live with the work because I don't know what is the best, uh, you know, I, I can speak, but maybe my opinion is not, you know, important, but I don't know what is best either to have the work in, um, in an institution locked in a storage for 10 years or someone really enjoying and appreciating the work and living with it and being inspired and transmitting generation after generation. So I don't know what, uh, you know, what is the great formula? We do our best on both cases, but sometimes it can be frustrating to, to, to place a work and not knowing that the work, when would the work would be shown. You know, when, when you were talking earlier about um, um, Waffle uh, and, and how, what an impact he had on other artists and, and uh, opening this, uh, I think you said that he, he was opening a new um, artist, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Residence. Residency, yeah, uh, in Accra. Um, you know, has, has that same sort of energy had an impact on you and your gallery and its trajectory? For his residence? No, no, no. I mean, I mean, simply that you described how he impacted fellow artists and, you know, his generosity in working with other artists and inspiring other artists and so on. But I'm wondering if, if that kind of energy um, carried over to the gallery more broadly, too. Yeah. Uh, if your question is, like, are, are we getting more artists because of that? Or no, we're not. But the, the thing with the, with, Artist. We have another artist, Ayana V. Jackson, who's uh, African-American based in Joburg, who's also creating a residence. I think there's coming a point when an artist is successful, he just wants to help other artists. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a natural feeling to have. Um, and so Amwafo is doing so because, because he can do that. And, and we, we encourage those like we want to work with him we want to be able to support what he's creating we want to facilitate even so a few of our artists were like oh I'll, I'll come and visit you in Accra and I spend some time with you uh, so so I think it's not it's not what is requested from the artists but I do understand when they reach a point of of of, of you know where they're able to sustain their practice and the studio practice that they want to give that chance and possibility. And we have a very important artist also from the US, Kehinde Wiley has an amazing uh, residence called the Black Rock of which Zora Okoku 
uh, the artist that I've shared who works with textile has been a resident and was able to create a great part of her work and also done some research. So there is some outcome, a visible outcome when artists are present in artist residence. Uh, one of the most famous one is the uh, Rushenberg Foundation, which also offer a residence for multidisciplinary artists. So I, I think um, when, uh, when that happened, this is what, um, you know, best outcome can, can happen for an artist um, because these, it's not transactional. It's just a retreat. It's just a place that an artist is offering for another artist because he or she, or they were lucky to, you know, to have a space. So what Amwako will be doing uh, will certainly impact the way we look at, will, will impact into um, the artistic community of Accra, for sure, uh, because he will create a place of conversation. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, the infrastructure are, you know, and where the, the artists work, as you know, she, whatever, but, it's it's still minimal. It's not something where they have, you know, the the, the, the infrastructure. One of the things that is also a challenge, and you know, we we managed to kind of work, it, it's simply um, the shipping of works because you know there's not like the white glove services like all of them. So that is also something that you know will change slowly because because people and collectors will be able to go to, 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 to Africa and actually go to galleries there and will be able to acquire works and then ship the works from Africa to wherever they, to where they live. So that is also something that is important to, 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 to reflect on um, because we are at this moment based here in Chicago and in Paris, but the reality and the reality of a gallery based in, in Africa is different from ours. You know, it goes, it has a lot of challenges. Let's see, there's a, there's a question, in the, uh, another question from Jenna Ferdy, um, who was asking about, uh, um, if, if you could speak a little bit, this is a, this is a different topic altogether, but uh, if you could speak about some of your, your past experience with UNESCO on um, cave paintings in Somalia. Yeah, uh, I will be very short because the time is running and I have to run. Uh, so I started an NGO was always interested in, in culture and arts and all of that, but what I was interested in is what define a country. And I would like to correct um, Ms. Uh, Perdi because uh, the last girl currently are in Somaliland because it is an autonomous part of the country. So uh, that was um, uh, the place where I, um, my family and we come from and like live there and I grew up there. Um, so, um, I was disturbed about, again, how, who hold the narratives. And I was disturbed by the fact that, you know, a couple of, a few French archeologists went to, to Somaliland and out of nowhere, they just been escorted there. And then they discovered um, rock art paintings uh, in, the, in the North part of Somaliland. And that idea of this, the word discover just kind of a created, um, you know, sort of an anxiety for me because I was like, who until, I mean, like who in the 21st century continue to discover, you know, I mean, when everything is, has satellites, everything is connected, everything has, who, who discover, who continue to discover? And I was a little bit off because I know those sites. There are sites where my family were living around and I took on that project first as you know a way of pushing back that sort of a post-colonial you know um uh, uh initiatives of discovering you know, things that existed it's like me going to the eiffel tower for the first time i say i have discovered the eiffel tower and i just go back so it didn't make sense at all 
So uh, I went, uh, I went there and I did this project and I wanted to really highlight that um, they were, you know, 4,000 years before Jesus Christ type of paintings. And that had not been recorded in a way, uh, recorded in connection with other cultures. So I got myself completely into that. I have no archaeological, you know, background. I have, you know, no scientific background. But my, my, my idea was to create a way of managing those sites that would benefit the population, that would create a durable tourism, that would connect universities. So it was more into a project management. And I get completely dived in and, and I was able to recognize one of the sites as World Heritage um, uh, endangered through the UNESCO. So that was a big, you know, yeah, and an accomplishment. Uh, but then comes the politics and everything. So for me, it was like, you know, dead artists are too complicated. So I, I kind of a switch to more contemporary artists because um, um, archaeological sites are very intense to kind of a work, you know, um, kind of a work with, uh, and because of course the society, um, a, um, uh, that because it, it's society, a kind of a scientific knowledge, which I was, I didn't want to be part of, but I did it because I was proud of my origin. I, would, I was proud of, you know, uh, that side being in that place and, and, and that side being so well preserved. Um, because if you Google Las Gale, it's one of the most preserved rock art paintings. So there were the, the oldest work, artists or works that I was able to work with. Um, but it's, it, it keeps me with the same motivation of who controlled the narratives. And kind of a, I'm tired that people speak on behalf of, you know, uh, the, of my people. I'm, I'm tired of them telling the stories. And, and I think there's so much we can say. Uh, and that's why I get uh, completely into that, um, that field, but that was my past life. So I still have an eye in, but not uh, active. Great, well, well, thank you very much. We've, we've learned a lot from you and, and uh, uh, we've kept you talking for a good long while here. So yeah. you're probably pretty I'm so sorry. Pretty I, like to... I like when there's an, interac an interaction. So, you mm -hmm. know, that's why you are a Dr. Mark uh, Delancey, your lecturer, and not. <laughs> well, well, thank, thank you so much. Julie, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Marianne. I really appreciated this. And thank you, Mark and everybody. Um, in the chat, there are some events that's coming up. Our next event is April 24, 21st. Foreman Bandama is going to talk about art, black magic or science, masterpieces of African metallurgy. And then there's another event that will be on April 25th and the Eventbrite links are in the chat. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye.